Hi, I'm Danny Ramos, and welcome to this week's Hispanic Speak Out TV. We've been on the air somewhere around two decades. Um, we provide information about what's going on in the Hispanic community, uh, and that information is always hot. That now we're in campaign season, so we are introducing to you for the next few weeks people who are running for office. So Hispanic Speak Out is will be introducing uh, the Hispanic community to some of its candidates. Some are Hispanic, some are not. Uh, I'm sitting here with Nelson Pena. Nelson Pena is a candidate. He's running for a state representative in District 48. So we'll be talking to him in one minute. Uh, right after uh, Mr. Pena, we'll be uh, talking to Darren Soto, Congressman Soto. He's the incumbent for U.S. Congress here. And um, he will be talking to us about a lot of things about 19, COVID-19. He'll be talking to us about the money that's supposed to be coming from Washington. It's being held up in the Senate right now uh, by McConnell and some of the other major things that affect the Hispanic community that he is relatively informed on because he is in Washington and he's our representative in Washington. Now, Mr. Pena is running for office to be the, the representative here in Central Florida in District 48 for Tallahassee. Okay, Nelson, how are you? I'm doing Welcome fantastic. Welcome to the show. Thank another, you. Another talk about you know how the community can improve. Yes. Um, tell us a little about you're, you're Dominican, right? You're, yes. You're Dominican. Were yes. you born in Dominican Republic? Yes, I was. Okay, yes, so was. what? When did you come here? I came to United States right after high school, right okay. after I graduated from high did school. Did you go to New York or? I, I actually came from Dominican Republic to New York, yes, okay. that's correct. And then you made it down to Florida? Uh, 12 years ago. Most people do that. Ago. Most people go to New York. Yes. And then they, even a lot of Puerto Ricans, they go to New York and then eventually yes. they land up in Florida. Yes. yes. So you're running for District 48 and that was uh, Amy Mercado's district. Yes. So she's leaving now, she said, I, I don't know, uh, well, I do know why she's not running, but um, she, I think she's running for county appraiser, Orange County appraiser. That is correct, yes. Yeah. Yes. So what made you decide to jump in to fill uh, Amy's slot? Well, I have been involved in the community for many years, and I have been a participant, uh, uh, a really active participant also in the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. So I've been involved in there as well. And I've been asked many times if I was going to run and what position was I going to run. So, so I didn't have any positions that really hit my heart. And uh, I felt after Amy announced that she was vacating that position, I felt that that was the position that I needed to, to run for so that I could represent the, not only the district, but also the city and the state. Okay. Um, Amy travels back and forth. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the reasons, you know, I, I, that's my personal opinion because she has a family, she has young kids. Mm -hmm. So she's been serving in 48 for a long time and running, she spends a lot of time in Tallahassee. Correct. Because you've got to be up there in December and you can't come back, I think, till the end of March. Correct. Many, yes. many, all the representatives have apartments up there. Yes. In order to be able to stay there because you can't travel five hours a day. Yes, correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And I know you have a family. Well, so, I do, but my, my situation is a little different. Okay. First, I have three teenagers. Okay. So one is already in college, one year in college, and I have two others. Are they going to vote for you? Uh, well, <laughs> she is. My two other ones is 16 and 15 okay. years old, so I still have that. They're not there yet. Ah, uh, shucks. <laughs> but, <laughs> yes. But yes, I do have full support mm -hmm. of my family mm -hmm. uh, as far as, you know, taking on this opportunity. And, and I really am excited. And I am passionate to show the people that I can and mm -hmm. that I will be a great representative. And I will make sure that not only through the support of my family, but the support of the community, that I'll be able to do a, a great job representing the uh, District 48. What do you think is some of the important issues facing Hispanics? I mean, the employment situation and, and some other things. Well, employment is one major factor. I mean... Most, most of the jobs or the, uh, the businesses that are being affected, restaurants, uh, service jobs, uh, hotels, you know, most of the industry that most Hispanics work. So it's affecting a great majority of the people, not only Hispanic, but obviously a lot of the, uh, the people that work in our community. 
And if they cannot work, they cannot pay the bills. They cannot sustain the families paying rent or the mortgages. So it's extremely important for us to revitalize the economy. Make sh- we need to make sure that we need to help those frontline em- uh, employees and workers that are essential to our economy. So we need to look for ways to help business, small businesses and make sure that bi- these small businesses hire and rehire those essential employees so that they could participate and start making money and obviously feel proud of sustaining their families and paying mortgages and, and all the responsibilities that we all have. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, there was big s- problems in getting the unemployment checks and support yeah. from the state. The computers broke down. Yes. And I think it's up, even up until now, I have people calling me, telling me that they still have not received unemployment. Yes. And they applied for unemployment a long time ago. You know, yeah. so there is a major disconnect there at the community level. Um, since you've come into the community, um, what do you think about situations like um, human trafficking, which is affects the Hispanic community? Well, that's a, that's also another another major factor and, and uh, issue that is not talked much about. You know, we don't really hear that, but it does affect our community as well. So. It's something that we need to, to bring up to the front line and we need to speak up about it and we need to be very aware uh, of this situation. So as far as the leaders in our communities, we need to bring up those topics and those issues so that they could be corrected. Mm-hmm. If nobody talks about it, if nobody brings them to the yeah, table... Yeah, it, it does it seem is, to be a taboo subject. Yes, because, exactly. Because um, yeah. Orange County, Orange County um, is has more human trafficking and prostitution than Las Vegas. And that's very surprising to people when you say that. You know? Well, it is surprising to me, to be yeah, honest with yeah, you. Yes. Yeah. And that's I incredible. have spoken to elected officials in Tallahassee, and they don't have any provision to help the people caught in that syndrome of human trafficking. In other wow. words, they can't leave because there's no place to take them. Yes, you know, nobody's yes. done anything about it. So if you get elected, you know, we'd love to sit down with you and, and address that issue. Uh, because the state, like you said before, it seems to be an issue that nobody wants to talk about. Yeah. You know, and it's a major issue because they get kids involved in human trafficking. You know. Yeah, it's not only a, I mean kids, families. So it's a major issue issue that affects not only a small group of people; it affects the whole culture, our whole community. Mm-hmm. So it's important for us to make sure that we we uh, fund resources and we bring uh, the, the appropriate uh, courses of mm-hmm. action to address those issues. So it's important that us as leaders uh, make sure that we look for the appropriate money mm-hmm. and the sources to make sure that we help uh, people in that area. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big, big problem, law yeah. enforcement. What about, how do you feel about the Black Lives Movement right now? Well, I mean, but, you know, I, the taking down of statues, you know, it's it's a multifaceted issue. It, it, it aff- again, that's another issue that is affecting us all. And uh, it is something that I feel it was about time for the entire country and even the world to understand that this rooted issue has been there for a long time, you know, and, and it's been affecting mostly the the black community. But it's also been affecting us all in many different areas as well. I have been a victim of that as well. Mm-hmm. So uh, for us to bring it up to the front line and finally being able to see that we can and we want to make some changes uh, as far as the way the police is treating you know, people in many different areas, that's, that, that is a great way for us to make sure that this gets resolved. Okay. Is there any other thing, that any other issues that you want to talk about, particularly that uh, strikes home? Well, I, let me let me jump in. I just, how do you feel about the schools opening up? They're going to be opening up the schools. That that affects so, me personally. Yeah. Because my wife is a teacher, mm-hmm. and she's very concerned. She was actually listening to uh, a meeting from the Department of Education that were actually uh, talking about many different options as to how they, they want to you know, accommodate 
the, all the kids at one time in the school, the same way that they had it last year, it, it, it is not feasible. I mean, the way they're, they're looking to open schools with all of the kids at the same time is not something that it seems completely practical. So my wife is extremely concerned. And I have two young boys who at least are going to high school. So they have a much more understanding, a better understanding than the young ones. But my wife is an elementary school teacher, so she's concerned that the little kids don't understand, they don't have the, the full understanding that they have to sit down for eight hours, for, for six hours. It's just not, not practical and, and, and feasible. So they really, I don't think that they should open the schools fully the way they would like to do it. I think they, we need to do it in phases and in, in small steps. Safety should be the number one uh, focus. You know, we need to stay safe. And whether we want to or not, COVID-19 still here and, uh, and, and is still affecting us all. So we don't want to uh, make this a worse scenario than the way it is. Mm -hmm. We need to be very, very careful. So my, my suggestion is for us to take this into small steps and see how we could have a combination of yeah, it, digital it, teaching and also yeah. It seems that, that, you know, and I've spoken to Jose Miranda, who is a co-host of the show, Yes. and it just seems that they're rushing into something. Exactly. Why are they so insistent on rushing in to open the schools? I mean, the kids have time. Yeah. It's not yes. like they have to be somewhere. You know, we're creating the schedule for the kids. So why, why can't they just say... Um, you know what? We're going to alternate. Half the kids come in Monday, and the other half come in Tuesday, Correct. then Wednesday. Exactly. That's have half the school there. Have distancing. You yes. know what I mean? Yes. And just slow it all down. You know, move forward, but in small, like you said, small in steps. small steps yes. and very, very strategically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I totally agree with that. Yeah. Totally How agree. about bringing your wife here? Is she allowed to talk about that? <laughs> oh, she would love to, yes, because oh, yeah? she's very concerned. Absolutely, yeah. yes. Well, yeah, yeah. she's, you, like you mentioned, you have you have kids in the school system, yes. so I know that both of you should yes. be, you know, are concerned about what you're exposing your children to. I, I my, my daughter, I have two grandkids that are in the, you know, one is in second grade and one's in kindergarten, and she's not sending them to school at all. She wow. decided, no, I'm going to I'm going to school at home, you know, yes. until this thing blows over. So she's not going to participate, and I, and I would think a lot of people are going to do that because they're afraid. Well, of course, from what, of just course. from what you're saying, there are a lot of teachers also that have the preconditions as well that is mm -hmm. affecting them personally. That's a good so point. So they are they are also at a higher risk. Yeah. Because if they get inf you know infected. That, that would not be a good thing for them. That's you know? a super good point that you just so, made, you know, that I didn't think of. Yes, a lot and of that teachers. Are teachers that are a little, well, not necessarily older, but that have lung that, issues they have or preconditions. Or they have preconditions yeah. that can, that can I, hurt I, them. I'm also a mentor for Valencia College Horizon program mm -hmm. where I go to high schools mm -hmm. and I, I actually talk yeah. and I motivate high schoolers. Mm -hmm. So, even that is also another area where I'm concerned. Yeah. You know, I, I, we, I'm, I'm sorry, but we just ran out of time. Okay. Okay, so thank you for coming. It's and, my pleasure. You know, we'll be working with you and helping and supporting you wherever we can. Uh, stand by because uh, Congressman Soto is coming right after uh, uh, my conversation with Mr. Pena, and he will be talking about what's going on in Washington with your funding check. That $600 check, that unemployment check, he's going to be addressing that issue. We'll be right back. Single year, because she's in foster care, because her father abused her, and her mother, her mother couldn't believe her. She is the child I am for. I am a volunteer child advocate. I am you. Florida residents call toll-free 866-341-1425. Um, this is Danny Ramos, and I'm here with Congressman Darren Soto on Hispanic Speak Out TV. How are you, Congressman? How's life treating you? You know, we are maintaining here in Florida, the congressional district, uh, uh, during what is a challenging time. I appreciate you having that. Is it going to record that one? Yeah, I could try my best to fix it, but I'll try. No, no, after editing. Oh, okay. We can 
know what's going on in the district. Um, you're our view into Washington, really, you know, uh, from the point of our organization, which is a nonprofit. And uh, we're always delighted in having you on and talking to you so that you can tell us um, how we're faring as, on a federal level. Um, okay, so um, we're talking about the stimulus check, and there's been a lot of controversy about a stimulus check coming back into um, uh, to help people in need, there's a massive amount of unemployment right now that's being reported. Still, we're spiking with coronavirus. Um, what is the situation uh, from the point of view of the House and also of the Senate? The House has already passed our HEROES Act, which would plug major holes in Florida and local governments and keep our heroes on the job, our firefighters, our cops, our nurses, our teachers. $1,200 per individual for up to $6,000 for a family. Uh, it would also extend unemployment out until January of next year for those who uh, still can't find work, uh, housing assistance, on other issues. The Senate, at first, uh, Leader McConnell had said states could should go bankrupt. Now they've said they uh, may be able to a trillion dollar package. Uh, President Trump's uh, folks from his administration have said anything from a $2 trillion package with infrastructure to a $1 trillion package, and we just recently passed out a national infrastructure plan on top of that this past week, preparation for those negotiations. But they're going to come to a head by the end of this month when Florida goes into their next budget, when the unemployment runs out, so I'm hopeful we'll see a bipartisan agreement like the other four we have passed already that come to fruition for the end of the month. Yeah, McConnell was talking about uh, a stimulus check for people making 40000 and under because he said, um, or he's feeling, or the Senate is feeling, that those are the, most, the people that are most impacted. Now, from my point of view, I know people who are making a lot more than 40000 still employed, still fully employed as if 19 never happened, and they were getting stimulus checks. So is there going to be a filtering process, do you think, now, um, so that more of the people that are needy are getting the check rather than just across the board, regardless of people who are still making money getting the check? Sure. So as you know, folks who made $100,000 or more were ineligible for check. So there was still some income guideline to make sure uh, in the first round that it went to folks who needed most. Uh, I will tell you this, I'm certainly supportive of focusing on folks in the lower income brackets, uh, but we also need to understand that the more restrictions we put on, the slower the delivery can be. Uh, so the simplest thing is to just do the same program again and get out that money quickly because people desperately need it. Uh, but if it requires a compromise to lower that down, I, I vote for it. I just want to make sure uh, every restriction we put on it will make the delivery slower, and I also have concerns about that. But we're ready to compromise. That's what we did in the last four packages. Uh, and we would uh, certainly be open to that going forward. What about people who are here that are undocumented? Are they going to be eligible for a check? Who are citizens or your green cards? Whether you're a taxpayer or not in the House bill. So if you have an individual tax ID number and you're paying taxes, you'd be eligible regardless of whether you were a citizen or not. We saw some really unfair things happening. Uh, we passed a similar bill out uh, for the CARES Act and then upon negotiation plan. To be a veteran who served our country, to marry to someone with a tax ID number or family was barred from getting the stimulus checks. Uh, so the most zealous advocates in our district were veterans and other um, American-born citizens who uh, were barred because they were married to an immigrant. So often they meet their spouses in court. Uh, so this bill says if you have a, uh, an individual tax ID number, you're paying taxes, you'd be eligible for it. If you didn't, you would, we wouldn't go as much into immigration status as much as your tax status. Uh, and it also applied to dreamers as well. Dreamers who got social security numbers and they're eligible to get them. We're able to get that relief. The dreamers who didn't apply for social security numbers weren't able to. So, uh, obviously, really affects a lot of folks in the 
defense a little bit. Um, they recently um, voted against having the oil pipeline um, coming in, I believe, from the Dakotas, and it's hurting. There was a complaint that it's hurting the economy of North or South Dakota, and uh, so I believe the court decided that this pipeline was inappropriate. Uh, what's your position on the pipeline? Well, I think the court made the right decision, and the Trump administration did follow the safety environmental protocols they were supposed to help uh, go through the, the environmental process. Try the most low-lying state in the nation, along with Delaware, and we're the most vulnerable to climate change. So we have to get aggressive on this stuff. We need to be pursuing greater renewables. Uh, gas is kind of the, the bridge energy. Uh, coal and oil uh, are big problems if we're still going to use that for utilities. We need to boost electric cars. Uh, we also uh, should still have nuclear energy in the mix, uh, along with wind and solar. So it isn't just about the short-term economic gains. This is the greatest threat to the human race. It's an existential threat to our state. Right now, the Army Corps, Army Corps of Engineers is developing a seawall 13 feet high to go across the city of Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and other major cities. And you're going to have to get rid of all the houses on the other side of it. Thousands and thousands of people will lose their homes in preparation for a seawall over the next 30 years if we don't get this thing under control. And we can do it by creating more higher paying green jobs. And that's what the moving forward infrastructure package we just passed uh, does. It boosts uh, electric car infrastructure. It boosts modernizing our energy grid for more renewables, nuclear, and other uh, non-fossil fuel uh, resources. It uh, helps to make sure that we're making them, giving these jobs to American workers at fair wages. There's a lot of things we can do to create jobs while also combating climate change. And that's the kind of vision that our country needs to lead on, or else, particularly in Florida, the consequences will be great to our quality of life over the long term. This is supposed to be, um, I heard, and maybe I'm wrong, that there's going to be an appeal on this. Is there going to be an appeal uh, for the decision that was made? I think there could be. I believe it was at the appellate level. But uh, I have to double check on that. I know that there was a recent court victory yesterday on it, I believe, at the appellate level. I know we signed on to an amicus brief uh, with a lot of members of the Natural Resources Committee uh, to uh, have the pipeline overturned. Uh, but certainly we can't just let that energy, energy need go to waste. We need to fill it with wind, with solar, with, uh, with uh, uh, nuclear and, and uh, ethanol and other sources, uh, but, but those are all ways where we can create American jobs rather than having to uh, pull that from uh, other areas. Regarding going back again to the Hispanic community, you have a, you're a major constituency because Osceola County is 55% Hispanic and I think um, Orange County is around 45% Hispanic, I'm not sure of the numbers. Uh, there's always been criticism on the Hispanic community, particularly the Puerto Rican community, that they don't turn out as much as they should for the vote. What is happening from your party side to stimulate the Puerto Rican community from exercising their right to vote and stimulating them? So first, let's put it in perspective. We had a record Hispanic turnout in 2016 and 2018, but compared to the Anglo vote, it's still low. Uh, and so that's what I think a lot of people are talking about. Everything we can. And we've delivered on four bipartisan packages uh, to help with everything from unemployment to stimulus checks to helping small businesses out uh, to make sure with housing and food and uh, also to, to help with the reopening in a, in a fair way that people can get back to their jobs. Uh, from a campaigning point of view, uh, it'll be a lot more about phone banking and not being doors this time around pandemic, uh, so you'll see a lot more folks uh, making phone calls and, and uh, obviously delivering on key issues for the Hispanic community. You know, Democrats passed Venezuela TPS, the Republicans are blocking it. Democrats passed nearly $5 billion in disaster relief after the earthquakes in Puerto Rico. The Senate hasn't done anything. 
Senator Republicans haven't done anything on this. We passed in a bipartisan fashion $42 billion for Puerto Rico Hurricane Maria recovery. President Trump has blocked more than half of it from getting to the island. Here in Central Florida, we passed infrastructure packs that would help fix the traffic, like on I-4 and extend Sunrail. We passed an increase of the minimum wage that would lift it to $15 an hour and let people out of poverty. We passed two packages on affordable housing. That's one of the biggest issues also here in Central Florida for the spend community and beyond. All these bills were passed by a Democratic majority in the House, and the Republican Senate hasn't done anything on it. And so there's huge contrast uh, in this uh, next election that uh, a lot of Spanish will be able to turn to, whether it's how we treat Hispanic workers here at home and how we help our brothers and sisters in Puerto Rico and Venezuela, our dreamers, and help out with uh, immigration reform. Uh, we passed a bill to allow a pathway for dreamers and those with TPS, a pathway to citizenship. So there are some really clear contrasts, and it takes some good old-fashioned politics to get the word out, and uh, then Hispanic voters will be able to make their own choices. Uh, in many areas, we care about the same things that others care about, whether it's hiring jobs, fixing the traffic, affordable housing, healthcare, environment, uh, social justice, like the police reforms we just passed after the murder of George Floyd. And then there's issues that are unique to us, like, like in foreign policy issues, like in uh, issues affecting uh, where our food we're from in our heritage, immigration issues. So all those things will be stark contrast. Voters have to make their decisions. Yeah, um, you said some good old-fashioned politicking. What does that exactly mean? What's the situation, the update on Puerto Rico statehood? Because I know that you are very actively um, engaged in that. Sure. So I've been working with uh, legislators on the island uh, in consultation on the bill they passed uh, have a very simple Puerto Rico statehood, yes or no question, and to have it on the general election ballot. These uh, are fixing two defects we've heard from uh, opponents in the past. One, that the prior, prior plebiscites, many of them were too complicated. This is as simple as it gets. And it's the hardest question to win. If you support independence or you support the Commonwealth, you vote no. If you vote for statehood, you obviously, uh, that's what you support. And then it'll be in the general election. We all know, and you know from your experience, being in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico, where you have a majority African American, a majority Hispanic populations. We've led, and uh, we do have some Republican allies uh, to vote yes in a majority fashion in November uh, to take that seriously and to take up this crusade once again. If the people of Puerto Rico vote yes, where does it go from there? It simply requires a bill in Congress, and then it has to either. Uh, it starts with a bill, and, uh, and so we already are putting together a resolution uh, talking about it. Obviously, I've already filed a bill based on the 2017 plebiscite to admit them simply already based upon that one. Um, but we know we're going to have to make some compromises, to, and so what that means is an admission. Conditions. And, uh, and so we need to understand that in history. When Hawaii and Alaska were being there were majority native populations in both those areas, and that was something that people tried to use against them. New Mexico, people said too many people, people spoke Spanish there. Texas was a nation, could a nation then become a state? And in Utah, with the religious minority of the Mormons, they voted 50 times for statehood before they were allowed it, which is why a lot of Utahns are supportive of statehood from Puerto Rico, and some of them are some of our biggest allies, the native Republicans. Uh, in, in the Congress, they've seen every excuse thrown at a lot of these states before they got in, and they're using every excuse in the book against Puerto Rico. But we need to have this plebiscite, very simple, in a large turnout election, and let the people decide. Well, we're in out of time, Congressman. I want to thank you very much, and like always, you know, your office has always been available to us, and I would love to have you on at least once a month, and I will talk to your scheduling office to see. You gave a lot of great information. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure, Danny. I'll be back soon. Okay. Thanks for having me. Thank you.